Hello, everybody. Welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Now, before we get started, make sure you're smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel. Every like and subscription helps build the channel. Even better, spread the word to your friends about the best wine show anywhere. So at the end of last year, I reviewed six different Cabernet Sauvignons uh, from Chile. To start off this year, I'm going to review eight different Sauvignon Blancs from Chile. This is the second of the series, and this is a free sample provided to me, and I have no restrictions on how to review it. If you want to get a more detailed explanation of Chilean wine, then check out my first episode of the Cab series, which is episode 99 about the Miguel Torres Cordillera de los Cabernet Sauvignon. The link will be below. This is, again, the second wine of the series uh, from Viña Casas del Bosque. Let's get into some background with them. The winery was founded by Juan Cuneo uh, in 1993 in the Casablanca Valley. For reference, it's about 40 miles or so southwest of the capital of Chile, Santiago, and about 25 miles southeast of the port Valparaiso. In addition, it's about 11 miles directly east of the Pacific Ocean. They currently have 189 hectares of vineyards at the estate. They grow Sauvignon Blanc, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, Syrah, Malbec, and Cabernet Franc. Uh, for Cabernet Sauvignon and Carmenere, they source from vineyards in Maipo, Colchagua, and uh, Cachapoal. They produce about 1.3 million bottles of wine in total. This is actually a cool piece of information, as many wineries don't put this out on their website like these guys do. They also export to over 50 markets around the world. Like, you kind of have to make a lot of wine to export to a bunch of markets. Anyway, the soil type in their vineyard is a shallow red clay over a decomposed granite substrate. They are, they are volcanic in origin and were formed about 110 million years ago. The clay allows a bit of water retention, but since it's not a thick layer, the granite also allows it to drain. The website says the soil adds a sea salt characteristic to their wines. They are very committed to sustainability and are certified under Chile's sustainability program. To review what sustainability means in general, that's not just the vineyard, that's everything associated with the winery. It's a combination of smart farming, which can mean being 100% organic or at least minimizing any non-organic farming to its bare minimum. Having some kind of biodiversity, using various conservation techniques in the vineyard and in the winery itself. It also includes treatment of employees, essentially making sure the employees are getting more than just a paycheck. Also, being a good citizen to the wider community and operating as a business at the end of the day, because we're here to make money, or they are. <laughs> Obviously, I'm not here to make money on this pod on, that's not podcast anymore, on this channel. I don't have the specifics of Chile's program, but most are pretty similar across the board. And from what I read on their website, on these guys' website, they definitely have a commitment to the environment and their people. When it comes to this wine, it's part of their botanic series, which they say means they consider it a low intervention wine. I interpret that as the least amount of adjustments are done to the wine. This usually means things like native yeast, not using or using very little processing aids, minimal use of SO2 and other things. In other words, letting the wine be itself, but with a nudge here and there rather than controlling every step. The vineyard is in one of the coolest parts of the western part of the valley. They practice drip irrigation and have a good yield of 3.4 tons per acre. Like I said in last week's review, that's in the range of high quality grapes. They mentioned foggy mornings with warm days and cool nights. We also get annual rainfall here of about 380 millimeters or about 15 inches, most of which occurs between their fall and winter of May and September. Almost a desert by definition, since it's five inches over the maximum of 10 inches per year to be considered a desert, at least according to National Geographic. Uh, for context, where I live in San Antonio, our average is just about 30 inches per year, and we have a mostly dry climate. Let's get into the stats of the wine. The 2020 Casas de Bosque La Cantera Sauvignon Blanc, suggested retail price, $18. From the Valle de Casablanca or the Casablanca Valley Dio, it's Sauvignon Blanc, presumably 100%, but it doesn't specify. Soil is a red, sandy loam, cold fermentation, 
rested on lease for a few weeks, clarified or fined, uh, cold stabilized. Now, like I said, basically all white wines go through this. It's filtered. Again, like I said last week, basically all wines go through some, almost all wines go through some kind of filtration. It's just on the text sheet, it's not always like specifically listed. Uh, th this was bottled on August 27th of 2020. Total production, 3,500 cases, which is about 42,000 bottles. The ABV is 13.5%. The total acidity is 7.2 grams per liter. That's more like it compared to last week's. Uh, the RS is three grams per liter and the free SO2 is 40 parts per million. So again, not really a high amount. Now let's get into the wine. So a, an RS of three, right? Um, we're still, so if you don't know, the, in the EU, they regulate RS or residual sugar. For a dry table wine, it can't be more than four. Uh, it has to be less than four grams per liter. Now there are exceptions. There are certain uh, areas in Europe that, or the EU, that maybe the wine making style uh, necessitates having a little bit higher RS. Um, where it's just, that's just the wine making style. It's, it's meant to be a semi, semi dry wine, or of course any dessert wines, that's totally different. Um, but when you have, when you have, uh, when you have a lot of acidity, there we go. When you have a lot of acidity, the NERS and their helps balance things out. This is why Riesling tends to be, has a little bit higher RS to it, but the acid is like like this, like seven, <laughs> okay, seven grams per liter. Uh, and actually, there, there are some there are some reasons that are like pH is like under three, and the the total acidity is just like off the charts. So, having a little bit of RS balances things out. All right, so let's get into it. I mean, same color as everybody else. So I would call like a medium plus aromatics. It's very fresh and youthful. It's also it doesn't like hit you in the face. Now this one again, I still get. That, that little bit of uh, green, so that jalapeno bell pepper thing. But I get more orange than say like a grapefruit or a lemon or a lemon or lime. And I do get, I get that pineapple. So I get that Hawaiian pizza thing going. And I feel like I get a little bit of other fruits in this. Now I feel like there's maybe a little bit of cantaloupe, a little more tropical, a little more mango type thing. Um, and it's, at first it was medium plus, it's a little more medium on the aromatics, it's not really jumping out of the glass. I kind of have to pull out some of the stuff uh, and obviously no oak. All right, so let's get into the wine. Super delicious. And that acidity is really there. So in comparing these two wines, the acidity on this is about the same as this. However, it's got a little more RS to it. I would say that the acidity of this is definitely in that closer to six grams per liter. Like I was speculating, you know, at least five, probably closer to six. That's probably where it's at. Um, anyway, not to bring back old wines or last week's wine necessarily, but this is super delicious. It's also, I would say more balanced. It's, it's not like, it's not like, you know, really hitting in the face with that one thing. There's a, a great, interplay with that bell pepper, a little bit of pineapple, a little bit of orange, a little bit of cantaloupe, mango, a little bit of white flour. Um, you're getting, you're getting a really good combination of these things. It's not, one doesn't really, really dominate the other. You can focus on one. You, like It's like getting a really well mixed um, piece of music. You can hear all the instruments None of them really dominate, but you can also focus. You can personally focus on that one thing in the song because maybe there's something about that instrument or that rhythm or the melody or whatever it is that you really want to focus in on, but you still hear everything else. That's what this wine's like to me. It's everything, all the components are there. It's balanced, it, everything's good. But if I really want to pick apart things, I could really dial in or focus on individual parts of the wine. More in the palate than the nose, because the nose is still kind of more subtle. It feels like it gets subtle, more subtle as I smell it. It was absolutely delicious. And this is, 
And to make a salad like is a complicated one. It's not a complicated one. This is definitely a wine that you're just gonna, you just wanna enjoy. Now, with that said, for me, this one I could just drink on its own. I could also have it with like a really fresh salad, you know, whether it's a uh, spring mix or spinach salad, something like that. Uh, fruits, you do char charcuterie stuff. Uh, you can do that type of stuff. I, I would I would really do lighter fare with this one um, because it's not so bold. Whereas like last week's wine has this boldness to it. And I really wanted more of a instead of like a salad or or like or like a fruit thing or a charcuterie thing. I wanted like a, a, a dish that could really stand up to it. And this one is more like like a first course or like beginning aperitif type of thing. Very delicious. I like it a lot. Nice. All right, so that's going to do it for today's show. If you enjoyed what I'm doing here, make sure you hit the like button and subscribe. And then tell all your friends, and we'll see you next time.